Well, first, thank you to Sum Zero for having us today. Um, I'm Nick Royer. I'm the co chief investment officer of Climate Commodities, which is a multi strategy asset manager with climate focused products spanning critical materials hedge fund, insurance, solar plus storage, tax credit yield, Delaware statutory trusts, and critical materials processing. I'll be leading this discussion today with Clean Earth Acquisitions Chief Executive Officer Aaron Ratner and Chairman Nick Parker. Aaron and Nick, can you briefly provide us some background on yourselves and how Clean Earth came together? You bet. Thanks very much, and thanks for having us on the, the program today. Uh, so I'm Aaron Ratner. I'm the CEO of Clean Earth. I've been working in new markets and new technologies for about 25 years. I got my career started off in Silicon Valley during the first internet wave back in the late 90s. I uh, spent about 10 years in Asia working on new markets and new asset management strategies. Uh, I got into sustainability about 12 years ago, uh, helped to build a impact investment bank called I2 Capital Group. Uh, I2 was one of the very first impact investment merchant banks focusing on landscape mitigation. I then transferred out of that and joined Generate Capital as the first developer in residence. Generate is one of the leading sustainable infrastructure investment funds in the sector. It was founded by Scott Jacobs, who had previously run the clean tech practice at McKinsey, and Jigger Shah, who runs a $40 billion loan book at the DOE. After two years there, I left and joined another fund, Ultra Capital, that was seeded by Julian Robertson to do similar investing sustainable infrastructure projects across wastewater, agriculture, and energy, all sub-$100 million distributed uh, infrastructure plays. I spent four years there as a partner and the head of origination, and roughly three years ago left to help my friend Andrew run a business called Cross River Infrastructure Partners, which was a developer uh, in the sustainable infrastructure space. And more recently, about a year and a half ago, started working on uh, the potential for a, a special purpose acquisition company, met our founders. Uh, we formed a small team, brought in Nick Parker, who's our executive chairman, who we're really lucky to have. And then since then, have built a team of 22 professionals, all of them focused on climate and sustainability in some form, many of them with operational experience, uh, which is a very wide net, but which we set up to ensure a successful outcome. Over to you, Nick. Yeah, well, thanks, Aaron. It's it's great to be with everybody here today and uh, uh, really delightful to be uh, um, sharing this conversation. So I've been at this um, energy and environment challenge for 30 plus years. Uh, got my start in the 90s with a, a family office headed by the person who literally put climate change and biodiversity on the map, uh, started the whole COP processes, et cetera. And we were doing a lot of early stage deals out of MIT and NASA and so on. And uh, it was my really my first exposure to this space and the potential here. Uh, and from there, I went on to build um, a corporate finance shop in Europe, which I sold, focused on energy and environment, built a consulting firm in North America, uh, built and sold that around energy and environment. And I got recruited by um, a group in Switzerland, headed up by Swiss Re, the big insurance company, to start what at the time was the first globally oriented private equity fund uh, in the world um, uh, focused on sustainability. So uh, from there, uh, we, uh, we got into some of the very first exciting deals in this space, uh, including the second ever solar IPO back in 2001. And uh, one of our LPs in this fund recruited me to help set up their corporate venturing program. And while I was doing that, I was reflecting on my experience over the previous 15 years or so. And it ended up coining this term clean tech, which now maybe has been eclipsed by other terms like climate tech. But I became the self-appointed Mr. Clean Tech for about a decade, uh, building the, the sort of the first generation of the innovation ecosystem. So, uh, uh, from there, I, um, I, I went on and helped the Rockefellers build uh, an emerging markets uh, merchant bank for clean energy, and I believe that was the first of its kind as well. And uh, since leaving the clean tech group, uh, I've been making my own investments uh, around the world in what I call exponential impact, uh, how we use solar and other technologies and combine that with artificial intelligence and create new business models as well as advising governments and putting together some platforms. And the most exciting platform um, is the SPAC that Aaron and I are leading uh, called Clean Earth Acquisitions Corp. And uh, that's where I find myself today. All right, thank you guys for that. Before we get into the trends in the various segments of the climate economy at play currently, 
Now, Clean Earth literally IPO'd on the morning of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, which served as one of a number of catalysts that has ushered in considerable market volatility. This has also led to two simultaneous developments, valuations in what constitutes the climate economy have come off significantly, and SPACs have been viewed in an increasingly negative light. How do you feel about the opportunity set in front of Clean Earth given this? Well, the way Aaron and I tend to work is he uh, he he starts the, the answer, and then I sometimes come in and uh, pick up the pieces from there. So, Aaron, why don't I let you take it first, and uh, I'll join in? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, no doubt it's been a it's been a, a really interesting ride for us uh, raising the two hundred thirty million dollars back in February. Uh, but you know, you have to um, you have to remember this is a secular, multi-trillion-dollar, multi-decade opportunity for everybody involved uh and even stepping back there there's, there's the mission and so nick and myself and everyone on our team is really focused on this with their career and, and the people on our who we work with are doing this regardless of market volatility this is what they want to be spending their time on so we have a very mission purpose driven driven group of people who have uh and when you have that kind of culture you can sort of weather any downturn but specifically as far as the economic opportunity you know, we as a species need to accelerate the deployment of capital and sustainable infrastructure for the projects far faster than we're doing right now and at much larger scale than our current trajectory. So we need all the tools out there. We need venture capital, we need non concessionary capital, we need grants and the DOE to come in and support projects. We need growth equity and infrastructure money and credit. And so, you know, SPACs are one of those tools. It's a way for a good company at the right time with the right team to access the public markets and an additional slug of capital that you know can help catalyze their growth trajectory, and we think that that this vehicle is one of those tools that will over time prove to be efficacious in the space. You know, the the, the public markets are are re relatively closed. People have forgotten that regular IPOs have uh, underperformed just as badly as SPACs in many ways. Uh, but you know, there's no doubt that that you know over the last 24 months certain individuals and teams took advantage of the SPAC structure to take companies public that really had no business being in the public markets yet. Uh, you know, and as far as the opportunity, um, look, this is a very capital intensive transition. This, this one needs to be built. This is not a software transition. This is a physical infrastructure transition. We need it across water, waste, energy, agriculture. And that, that's where the trillions of dollars come in. Uh, that means there'll be a lot of successes and a lot of failures but certainly a lot of room for people to try and iterate and try to get a lot of capital into the space. And so we're, you know, in, in the short time that we've been a public company, we've met with over a hundred businesses. Um, you know, some of them are great candidates. A few of them will be good candidates in the next few years. Many of them aren't. And it's true, you know, SPACs in general are, uh, are you know, are under, a, um, under the microscope right now, and rightly so. It was a tool that was easy to abuse and certain people did it, but it doesn't take away from the fact that the public markets are a great way for good businesses and good teams who know what they're doing to raise capital at the right time. Yeah, I, I, I would just jump in and sort of underline that it's about quality and quantity, and the quality is... Uh, we're very happy to see the standards and uh, uh, rising. Uh, we think we've got a, an A team, um, people with tremendous public markets and private markets experience, and we, we want to do this right. Um, and we want to work with teams that are equally professional. And we think um, that doing this right will, uh, will uh, end up being uh, successful. The, and that's partly because of the quantity as somebody who's been in this space for so long and basically for many, many years was playing with the crumbs and playing with, you know, virtually no interest uh, in uh, sustainability or decarbonization or energy transition. Now, virtually every single major corporation, investor, et cetera, is dialed into this. And, um, and so the secular trend that Aaron referred to uh, now married to the sustainability trend means this is an epic cycle. The real challenge is, can you assemble the right team to back the right team? And that's what we think we've done so far. I think you bring up some really interesting points there as far as you set some of the companies that are in this, let's call it climate economy, um, they structurally need to be public and that velocity of capital is gonna come from a vehicle like a SPAC. And we're gonna meet some of these stated climate targets. And I think that one of the important things that is to touch on some of your points, those institutional guardrails that could come from a team like Clean Earth that back a first time management team going to public markets. 
is, is really, really important. And I think, you know, to the next point, you know, most SPACs have focused on this area of taking earlier stage companies in the public markets. You know, at, at our firm, Climate Commodities, you know, we talk a lot about the available return in the climate economy, which can change considerably in a short period of time. You know, some years it's a new issue, uh, some years it's distressed, um, some years it's just buying good companies at reasonable prices. So, you know, really underpinning the importance of being able to be native across these markets through a well-defined mandate. Now, how is Clean Earth's mandate and target identification process differentiated? Well, I think for starters, uh, you know, everybody on our team and certainly the core individuals on the board and the executive team and, uh, and the, you know, the people on the advisory board who remain intimately involved really care a lot about their reputation. There's no amount of money that anyone could make on this that would somehow make it okay to, uh, you know, profit significantly and destroy our reputation in the market, particularly going back to that comment I made about the mission of being catalysts for capital deployment into the energy transition over time. So, you know, you're, we're not uh, we're not in the business of just getting a deal done just to make money. Uh, you know, we we believe that there are good teams out there and good companies, and that the filters that we're using and the screens we're using are going to lead us to a successful outcome. But our reputation remains the most important thing here. Uh, you know, <clears throat> as far as the, the the screens and filters we've used. We're not really taking any technology risk. We've met with a lot of, you know, very exciting, rapidly growing climate tech companies that are worth over a billion dollars and should be, and one day could be, you know, multi-billion dollar companies or more, but they're not ready to be public businesses. They have inconsistent or opaque revenue. They can't actually contract revenue in the long term. They've got a, still a lot of execution risk on their production uh, side. So th there are, are risks that are inherent in startups that make it unsuitable be a, to be a public company, particularly in an environment like today where the, you know, the equity markets are gonna be uh, really unforgiving. And we've applied that since day one, and it's meant saying no to a lot of really great companies. We've certainly met a lot of wonderful CEOs and management teams along the way, but there's a real difference, and this is really critical to unpack. There's a real difference between a really great climate company and a really great climate company that's also ready and primed to be a public company. And that comes down to the technology, the sector they're in, the way that their cash flows are contracted, the way that their supply chain volatility can be uh, minimized. And then, of course, the team and the people running the business who are about to step into uh, the public theater and read quarterly earnings reports and, you know, have to operate in a very different way than they used to. Yeah, there's, there's this, like... There's sort of several levels of risk here. Um, so often, I think people in the climate clean space have uh, invested in solutions that the world wasn't needing or wanting yet, uh, even if the technology was great. Uh, and so getting the timing right, um, you know, is the world ready to, you know, um, solve the problem of plastics in the ocean? Well, we've known about this problem for 20, 30 years. It's only in the last five the capital and the formation has really started there. So I think the risk of not, not following too many headlines and, and really sort of getting down into, you know, where, where are things really heading? Where's, where's there a pain point that willing, people want to solve and uh, are willing to issue purchase orders um, uh, and so on around? And then the second risk is, uh, of course, the, the teams that you back and, and um and, and that's twofold again, you know, do we have the skills in our team to help that team? And then is that team capable of executing? And uh, certainly for Aaron and I, we have not seen any reason to take any risk on a team that hasn't got a proven track record of execution. So uh, that's been a filter that we've employed on every deal that we've looked at so far. And we're getting very confident that we're finding uh, ways to uh, back at the right teams. Uh, and, and then in terms of the headline risk, um, you know, now we're facing the reality of things like putting a price on resilience, uh, getting off Russian gas, uh, uh, taking net zero seriously uh, in a time frame that matters. And so what, we're, what we've really been picking through is, you know, how does that really shape markets in the next two, three, four, five years? And then matching that with the right team. And then finally coming back to ourselves and saying, do we have the skills and the experience to really be able to help and add value, both from a mission and monetization standpoint? So that's that's our ethos, that's our approach, and that's how we're taking sort of the three levels of risk uh, and dis disaggregating it uh, step by step. 
I think one more thing I would add, you know, on that is that we, you know, SPACs have a bad name right now, uh, but prior to that correction, we were really thinking about this more like a merger. Right? We don't consider ourselves to be out in the market acquiring a business that could either go to the moon or go to zero and hopefully, uh, you know, ourselves and some early investors get out with some cash in their pocket. We're really positioning this as a vehicle that will merge with a great operating company and help them step into a more uh, functional catalytic framework where they can access cheaper forms of capital at greater velocity and grow their business faster. Yeah. Uh, hey, Aaron, you and I are riffing off each other here. I mean, look, uh, the reports that are out, including the IEA report, International Energy Agency report that came out on Wednesday, every report from MIT, from IEA and so on is saying we've got to go at a pace that's three to five times faster than what we're doing right now in terms of the energy transition and decarbonization. So really what you're looking for is a team that can scale and needs the kind of capital that we can bring to bear through our SPAC and a public listing uh, to really execute. That's what it's all about right now. It's not about gee whiz new breakthrough technologies in our view, the technology is there. The business models are increasingly proven. It's about whether you can really scale at warp speed. And that's what's, that's what's needed in the world, and that's the market opportunity that we're pursuing. So switching gears a little bit, you know, currently clean earth stated focus areas encompass the full spectrum of the climate economy, which I think is important. You know, however, starting with the energy transition, could you walk us through some of the trends and opportunities you're observing? And maybe Aaron, uh, to kick this off for our listeners that are not that familiar with the climate economy, you know, break out. There's really two sectors within energy transition encompassing what we call electrons versus molecules. So maybe just a bit of background there and then jumping into some of the trends and opportunities. Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, so when you think about the energy transition, really what we're doing is we're rebuilding our infrastructure. We're rebuilding the way that we eat and provide food, not only to ourselves, but the way we feed our food, uh, what we do with our water, both from a consumption and reprocessing perspective, what we do with our waste, how we travel, how we communicate, uh, the, uh, how we live in buildings, right? So everything is an infrastructure play here. And infrastructure is a get rich slowly game. And everything you do to go faster creates risk. So one of the benefits that we have is looking over our shoulder at what's been happening in the public markets in the last 24 months. We've seen a lot of failure. A lot of companies have tried to go too fast and uh, crashed because they weren't in a sustainable trajectory. They didn't set it up for success correctly. So you know, the, the opportunities and, and trends, uh, you know, there's no shortage of data to the downside as well. And I think that's really important. We, we've, we've benefited from that tremendously as far as lessons learned and how to focus our, our time and our energies on finding a successful outcome here. Uh, you know, the electrons versus molecules thing really comes down to how projects are getting financed in the world today. The, this energy transition will not be successful without project finance. The, the corporations themselves cannot fund all of the infrastructure on their own balance sheet. They need project finance investors like Generate Capital, like BlackRock Decar Partners coming out and, and really putting huge amounts of capital into the way the world works. And there's a big difference there between electrons and molecules that people are just waking up to in, in, uh, in solar and in storage and in systems where you have de minimis technology risk the minimum human error, room for human error, you can finance a lot of these projects heavily levered and go out and get a good night's sleep because the machine is going to most likely work. And then you can buy some insurance to plug the gap. In more advanced systems like carbon, hydrogen, renewable natural gas, uh, all sorts of organic waste disposal, you're dealing with molecules and that creates an incredible amount of complexity. The supply chain changes with the environment, with heat, temperature, pressure, uh, you, you've got uh, supply chains that actually change the chemical nature over time as they decompose. Because of that, you get tremendous amounts of, of, of risk to the downside. But if you are using project finance capital to get your business, you're selling most of your upside. So you end up structuring an asymmetric risk to the downside before you even begin your work. And so a lot of people headed down that path in the last few years, particularly in the renewable natural gas space. And it's, <clears throat> it's had a very challenging outcome. So when we look at the sectors that are most exciting for us, uh, we're looking at, at certainly sectors that are innovating a lot. There's a lot of venture capital money and growth equity money going into them, but that's not where we're playing. We're working with companies that are de-risked, that are scaling rapidly. And what they really need is they need to find ways to push 
their scale up, the capitalization of their scale up off of their own balance sheet and start to build either production capacity, delivery capacity, infrastructure capacity, or do whatever they're doing as a service. This is one of generating capital's great innovations was infrastructure as a service. And so, you know, we are working with businesses that have something up and running that works just fine, or maybe it's completely proven in the market uh, where we can step in and you can start to put a tremendous amount of equity capital to work using publicly raised equity. The debt out there, whether it's government debt from the DOE or the USDA or commercial banks is, is readily available. And even with interest rates having gone up recently, that, that credit is still gonna be available over time at a pretty attractive rate. So, you know, that means we, uh, you know, we still have a bunch of sectors available to us. Uh, I'm not sure, though, that I'm answering your question specifically. So do you want to refine it or do you want to help me get to the, the, the punchline that you were looking for? I guess, you know, one of the things that, that we could do here, I think that'd be helpful is segmenting, you know, let's say solar plus storage and electrification side of the equation um, and the industrial decarbonization, let's say hydrogen and carbon capture and storage, uh, and just walk through the opportunity set in those specific areas from your vantage point. Sure. Sure. Well, you know, solar, uh, there is quite a bit of innovation in solar still around, uh, you know, capacity for uh, solar capture, right? The solar panels are still increasing in their uh, their uh, ability to capture energy that will obviously go up over time. But solar is obviously very proven and it's pretty much a, a corporate finance game at the moment. And so there are, <clears throat> excuse me, developers who are financially savvy, who know how to use uh, capital to scale their business in a, in a way that makes a lot of sense for their equity investors and makes a lot of projects available for their lenders who are out there and, and are starting to, uh, with the way the world's going, whether they're in Europe because they're trying to get off Russian gas or they're in the U.S., uh, you know, and, and the markets are opening up, uh, those developers are start, starting to see their, the opportunity really accelerate. In particular, we're starting to see uh, in Europe lenders lending capital to solar projects that are going merchant. So what this means is as a developer, if you have a the solar park, you know, historically you needed to get a 20 or 30 year power purchase agreement in order to secure your revenue in order to go get your project financed by the equity so that you could, you get a lender to put some debt on the project and keep the cost of capital down. And in a, in a theater where, you know, everything is a corporate finance exercise because the cost of capital is racing to the, to, to the floor, that's really important. But if, if it, in fact, in Europe and then the U.S., it is possible for lenders to loan to projects that have merchant exposure where they're selling, you know, all or significantly all of their electricity in the open market without that power purchase agreement. That's going to be a, a game changing outcome for solar developers and certainly for the, the equity investors in those projects. And it'll make solar, again, a very attractive investment opportunity for equity investors. Uh, on the molecule side, it still remains very risky. You know, there, there's a lot of innovation in carbon capture. There's a lot of innovation in carbon utilization. Companies like 12 out of San Francisco who are taking CO2 molecules and breaking them up and using them to decarbonize the supply chain of their host. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of hydrogen right now, whether it's production of hydrogen using electrolysis. People are talking about uh, pink hydrogen, which is nuclear powered electrolysis. That hydrogen will be used for ammonia, for fuel, or for transportation. There, there's a lot of innovation, but it's still very small. Scale and it's it's got a long way to go before those companies are are going to be sort of uh, you know mainstream and de-risked enough for industrial customers to to depend on them 100 percent for uh, the energy source. Yeah, I think that was a very comprehensive answer. So I'm not going to embellish on that unless uh, we've got the time for uh, to circle back. Nick, I'll ask you one thing. Uh, having participated in the solar space uh, in such early days, you know, how would you articulate to the audience uh, how the what has enabled the cost to come down and really what has catalyzed the technology maturity that we're seeing today? Well, you know, okay, so let's go back, you know, 20 years. Um, uh, uh, costs have come down 80 plus percent in those years, making uh, solar the cheapest source of electricity for 80 plus percent of the planet uh, today, uh, particularly with storage now, where storage costs have come down uh, at, a, at a sort of roughly equivalent rate in the last decade. Uh, so what I see as changing, uh, Nick, is that I think it's the business models that have emerged uh, because of the technology shift uh, and cost reduction. So you look at a company like Solar Mosaic, which lends uh, to solar home systems. Initially, that's what they did. Now they 
have a more comprehensive portfolio of offerings. Uh, they went from a small community-based group to uh, somebody who's uh, lent billions of dollars now. And uh, are they a solar company? Are they a credit company? Are they an analytics company? Are they a systems company? Don't really know anymore. All I know is that solar is very much part of what they do. Similarly, you look into emerging markets. Um, you know, the big problem with solar in the developing world was the upfront capital cost. So now you've got uh, business models uh, that are uh, like things like uh, pay as you go solar, uh, which uh, made it possible. Basically, you're leasing lease to purchase, uh, and it's made it possible for, for people in Africa to go clean and green and and have a lower cost of uh, energy. But I think what's enabled the, the innovation was the was when uh, the mainstream started waking up and going, this solar thing is is real. And you started seeing major manufacturers go, well, hang on, we we make uh, LCDs. Uh, the opposite of that is a solar panel. We know how to how to manufacture this. And so you're starting to get uh, sort of mainstream uh technology, um, understanding of engineering and so on, which, which I think played a major role in bringing down costs. And then public policy. When Germany came out with their two-page uh, um, uh, legislation that uh, required um, uh, utilities to purchase solar and, and so on, uh, it was really the first sort of fit program, as they call them, uh, in the world. This kickstarted Chinese manufacturing. Now, uh, the dynamics around that have changed uh, in terms of the politics, uh, but the Ch Chinese brought their manufacturing prowess to the table um, and probably some other things as well that we might not approve of and radically br brought down the cost of solar. So I think it's a scale issue now, uh, times uh, manufacturing know-how times people realizing that this is a major growth sector and, and worth their time and effort, which finally has brought in a much higher quality of entrepreneur uh, than was there 10, 20 years ago. And we're seeing this with our SPAC. Uh, the caliber of the teams that we've been talking to and looking at is uh, out of all recognition of what one might have seen 10, 15 years ago. So when you combine all those things, I think that's why we've ended up in the situation we're in now, um, where solar is is really very competitive and very appetizing to a lot of people. And yeah, you know, that that's an interesting dovetail into you know, discussing just what's happened in the last few months. You know, COVID has changed the way we do a lot of things, and it has also disrupted the global supply chain uh, to a degree that most people who are managing business today, running risk, have, have not experienced in their career. And you know, this has subsequently shifted the political climate in the United States and Western Europe, for example, to reshoring. And really, if you look at our sector, locating the picks and shovels of the climate economy in the Western world. Um, you know, I really think this is cemented from a policy perspective by the Biden administration invoking the Defense Production Act for United States solar manufacturing. You know, how does this translate into investment opportunities in general? Um, and what are you seeing from your vantage point of clean earth? Well, I'll just... Uh, go ahead, Aaron. <clears throat> Nick, why don't you go ahead this time? Well, I was just going to hop in and say, you know, I'm, I'm based in Toronto, Canada, and it's the mining finance capital of the world. And the only thing that's being talked about right now is, uh, you know, rare earths and critical minerals. Uh, and again, onshoring around that, because we're going to need all those things uh, for EVs and uh, and the growth of the, the green economy writ large. So, you know, really, you know, how far upstream does one go here uh, and the kind of technologies that enable you to do cleaner, greener, more efficient mining um, and so on and so forth. So uh, I, I think that the um, the onshoring, you know, may be due to some some degrees of political rivalry and, and uncertainty around that. But I think the key driver is is the price on resilience, as I like to call it, the, the, that we, we want to make sure we've got certainty of supply uh, one way or another, whether it's uh, um, PPE for the next pandemic or uh, more localized forms of energy or um, the supply chain into that. Uh, I think all these things are radically changing the dynamics above and beyond uh, the, some of the political issues uh, across the Pacific in particular. Yeah, that's that's a great point. You know, the energy transition 
was originally just energy efficiency, and then it became, well, we have to really transition now, and then it became energy security very quickly. And, you know, today, coal is an ESG fuel in Germany because natural gas is so expensive, they can't afford to provide heat for the lower class in the winter uh, when the Russians cut off the tap. So the world's been turned a little bit upside down. And the, you know, the, um, in the U.S., Certainly, there's no, you know, there's, there's no doubt that the Defense Production Act is going to be a huge support. Government backstops of anything are really valuable, but the onshoring of the manufacturing of energy transition equipment into the United States is going to be a very significant shift that that will take a long time to uh, go back to foreign production, if ever. And it it makes the product more expensive for sure. It creates supply chain inefficiencies where you have to move inputs farther across the world but it de-risks availability. And where we're headed with this now is availability is taking primacy over pricing in some cases. And so what, what, what consumers, what it, whether it's you know, commercial industrial or utility consumers of solar equipment are waking up to is, well, you know, they, they, don't, they definitely don't want to pay more for their equipment, but they can't run out of equipment to not you know, continue with the energy transition and continue to build and take on more solar power. So here in the U.S., you know, we'll see more solar manufacturing. It will be more expensive, but it will be available, and it'll be consistent and reliable. There might be better quality. Certainly from a labor perspective, there aren't going to be any labor issues around who's in the factory building that equipment. Uh, it'll be much more transparent supply chain, and all those things are going to matter more and more, particularly to public companies who are being evaluated and scrutinized on the carbon intensity, on the ESG, all three of those. Uh, letters, uh, aspects of their supply chain, whether it's, you know, who's building it, how sustainable it is to, you know, what kind of corporate governance you applying. Yeah, just to add on to that before I hand the talking spec, stick back to you, Nick, you know, we used to joke about sweatshop solar, you know, uh, you may have a nice clean energy, but if it's made in, in, a, in a really poor working environment and uh, you've polluted all the waters around you uh, in making the, the panels, um, you know, before nobody really cared about that. Now people do care. That's the S in the ESG. And furthermore, people have the ability to trace and monitor this stuff in ways that they never had before. And I think there's going to be no hiding for people. If you don't walk the talk, uh, you're going to get called out. And so for us, very, it's very important with our SPAC that we're backing a team um, that gets this and gets the, the business importance of it and is ahead of the curve. Um, we think that's a maybe a marginal, but a, a definitely a source of value, not just a compliance thing. And you know, it's, it's interesting to add to that. You know, what we're seeing in some of our physical trading businesses is that you know, there is a premium being paid for Western uh, slash American made products and there are longer duration contracts being inked. So there's really a mechanism that's in play it, this time, this moment, to structurally de-risk some of these businesses through long-term contracts and put SPAC, for example, set them up to take velocity of capital that in prior environments wouldn't necessarily make as much sense. They were really in a unique period of time. And, you know, I think that, that, that speaking on the, the topic of reshoring and just the broad constituency of the climate economy, you know, one thing that I know I've discussed with both of you, and it'd be interesting to, to explore here is there's so many legacy businesses that are carbon intensive, but they have phenomenal teams of engineers, of researchers, and a legacy delivering, producing just across the full spectrum of really the energy infrastructure. And now these businesses are having to evolve and adapt. You know, how do you think about this in the context of SPAC of taking, you know, you take Clean Earth's team, for example, spanning a lot of different sectors, a lot of experience. So even someone like myself, who grew up in the oil and gas sector in Oklahoma and now is running a clean energy business. How do you take a legacy business and apply its core competencies to what's going on now? We, um, we look at a lot of, and we continue to look at a lot of, uh, you know, sort of industrial operating businesses that have an opportunity to profitably and efficiently decarbonize their business and make more money for their investors while doing better for the environment. Uh, you know, a great example of that is Hennessy. Uh, that's a fact that went out, wanted to get into the uh, clean transportation space. And rather than taking a lot of risk on a new vehicle type, they went out and, and merged with a bus company, a 100-year-old bus company called Bluebird, and they're funding the energy transition on their balance sheet. So their entry point was lower. 
their outcome will probably be a lot more successful because the, the technology risk is seriously uh, mitigated. So we've looked at a lot of those. We've looked at uh, ferries and transportation. Uh, we're excited about those spaces. We haven't found anything that felt like a really good shift into the public markets at the moment. So we're, we're sort of sitting, keeping those as backups. We might, you know, go back and have those conversations in 12 or 24 months. But, you know, every business that's operating is carbon intensive right now. And every product that you're consuming is, is carbon intensive. And it's only a matter of time before most of the consumer products that we have have a carbon intensity label on them that helps consumers understand exactly what they're they're doing with their money and their consumption pattern. So we think that opportunity will will sort of be uh, present across all industries going forward. Yeah, the only thing I'd add to that um, uh, is, you know, the reporting requirements of companies. Um, on top of that, uh, you know, you, you, it, 100 years ago, uh, when Wall Street collapsed, we didn't have gap, we didn't have mandatory public reporting. <laughs> that got changed pretty quickly 100 years ago. Now we realize again, we don't know how to properly account in a consistent, transparent way for uh, things like um, uh, social and environmental factors. That's changing. Um, there's uh, there's uh, over 150 standards out there, which are now being consolidated. People like the SEC are taking this very seriously. And, and I think this is going to force a uh, change in companies um, that otherwise don't think they have uh, a, a reason to act. You know, they're not you know, they're not a car manufacturer or an oil and gas producer. Uh, they're just a company somewhere. Um, and I, I, I think this is going to drive a lot of change and value creation as well. The other thing I would say is there are businesses that don't realize they have a role to play in the energy transition. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that I, I look at um, artificial intelligence a lot right now. And I'm running into companies who are doing work in areas like machine vision for um, you know, manufacturing and process uh, quality management and, and so on. And, and yet they have a huge role to play in helping companies decarbonize and become more energy efficient. So I think you're going to see even more entrance of companies that are just making stuff um, that's good, uh, maybe with leading technology like AI, and who are realizing there's opportunities. Uh, so it's not just the, the, the laggards and the incumbents that have got to sort of catch up and play ball in the, in the low carbon economy. It's others who are going to wake up and realize, oh, I have a role to play and there's money to be made. And uh, that, that's pretty exciting because we need all hands on deck. And, um, and, and as Aaron has been uh, trying to share and, and make the point, you know, it's every single sector and every single company virtually in every sector. So that starts getting uh, pretty interesting, but particularly when you get the transparency of knowing what's going on in people's supply chains and then having them to have to report it in a, an intelligible standardized way. I think this is gonna really juice uh, uh, capital coming into this space uh, over the coming years. Yeah, so let's be, we can be a little, let's be specific about that just since we're, we've got mm -hmm. a, an audience here today. <clears throat> you know, one great example of that is, is food production. Uh, you know, if you look across the world right now, there are, there is major disruption to the global food supply chain. There are countries where people are riding in the streets because they don't have food. And actually, if you look back in history, um, a lot of authoritarian governments have lost control of their people and, and their government because they ran out of food, whether it's Suharto in Indonesia or the Russians back in time. So, you know, we think that the way that food is produced and transported and stored and consumed. And then the, you know, the, the leftovers process is going to be a, just a tremendous opportunity. We've met with a lot of indoor agriculture companies. We've met with a lot of companies that are farming fish on land. We've met with companies that have technologies for uh, packaging and transporting food that makes them more resilient to longer term storage. Uh, we haven't found anything yet that we thought was ready for the public markets, but you know, those are issues that are critical to everybody every single day and we think that over time there will be the, the, the public markets will really open up to that part of the ag tech and food tech space in a way that will create a lot of opportunity because it'll be companies that, that consumers can really identify with and really create that, that high level of transparency on what people are doing with their consumption behavior and, and another another sector where we've seen a lot of opportunity uh, uh, Nick alluded to a little bit is the sort of climate fintech space right everything in climate and the energy transition and ESG is going to need to be measured, measured, monitored, evaluated, 
And that's going to create a lot of credits, which can then subsequently be traded and monetized. So there is not only a whole infrastructure around software that will provide the, the AI and the monitoring and the controls in place and for data collection, but then subsequently there's a lot of entrepreneurs creating some very interesting climate fintech products and credits and trading mechanisms so that people who are either consuming or producing or capturing those uh, environmental credits can then go on and monetize them and trade them. And that again becomes a, a mechanism for catalyzing more investment because people can start to profit from their activity in the space that they couldn't beforehand. And certainly if you look at what happened, what's happened in the traditional fintech space in the last five years, I mean, the scale of growth has been incredible. And we think that will come to climate fintech as well. And, and one, you know, one, one thing to add there that, that's, all, that's also pretty interesting. And I think, you know, if you look at what, what, what emanates from these challenges, there are critical service gaps and there are capital gaps that extend over long periods of time. And another service gap we're seeing there is, you know, really being at the onset of the first inning of transference of risk from capital markets to insurance markets to catalyze project capital. Um, yeah, that's another trend that we're observing in our firm called Commodities, and I think it you know, also translates into opportunity for clean earth. I don't know, Aaron, if you want to touch on briefly, given your project finance uh, experience there, you know, how um, that works and what kind of opportunity set that provides. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, so the, if, when, you, when you put the microscope out, there's a lot of economic efficiency and financial uh, de-risking that can be done through new instruments like insurance. Uh, where you can apply, you know, small, affordable insurance products all along the, the supply chain and the, the execution of this energy transition. You know, we have looked at uh, some companies there. We haven't found anything we like, but we, we do think that, uh, you know, the insurance business and climate is going to be really successful. Uh, the traditional insurance business has been growing, uh, you know, at a very slow pace. The, the climate sector is growing in multiples every year. And, you know, the more you can identify quantify and then monetize uh, risk and de-risking of businesses, the more you can create uh, markets and you can help businesses focus on what they're good at and help, you know, the financial markets can help offload some of that, that extra burden and make the industries more efficient. And, you know, to, to echo some of, some of these, some of these comments, it's, it's, it's interesting as the, the push towards ESG and then the uh, acceleration in scrutiny around standards has really made their, really made a product differentiation in legacy product suite. So, you know, it's, it's, it's quite interesting coming from um, my background growing up in a family where everyone works in the oil and gas sector. You know, we were always told um, growing up that unless the lights don't turn on, no one cares about the quality of the product or where it came from. Um, and now that's different. You know, you're really seeing from, you know, cradle, cradle to cradle, people, people looking at where did this come from? Where is it going? Where is it? Where is it going to rest? You know, is there a recycling aspect to it? So the way that people consume and function and do their their daily lives has has been upended by this push, which has provided a huge opportunity. That being said, um, and we're bumping up on forty five minutes here. Maybe as one last question before we open up the Q and A. Um, you know, there has been a myriad of thoughts around execution, and it's it's hurdle for SPACs in general. Um, and what gives you guys so much conviction, your ability to close on a merger in this market environment? Well, I think it, it really comes down to our team, you know, and if you look across all asset classes, most venture capital funds don't make money. Most growth equity funds don't make money. Most public market hedge fund investors make less than the market. So, you know, the, the profitability in the top you know, decile is the anomaly, not the norm. Uh, our team is an incredible group of people. We have a lot of people with a lot of SPAC experience. They sit on the boards of other SPACs. They've raised capital for other SPACs. Some of our founders have founded other SPACs. We've got just a, a lot of people who know what they're doing. Our bankers have done an incredible job of working with us and working with the companies with whom we've contemplated merging. Our service providers, whether it's our counsel or our accountants, know what they're doing. So we don't have anybody learning on the job. We have people who know what they're doing and, and you know, are going to do their best to, uh, you know, affect a successful outcome. Uh, we've also de-risked our exposure to technology. So, you know, at, this, at the moment, a uh, successful outcome for us is really based on execution. So, the, you know, that helps a lot because it minimizes the exogenous variables that can derail a process like this. And, you know, I think, you know, another thing about our team is that we're, we're pretty well distributed across industry. We've got people in fintech. We've got people in oil and gas. We've got folks over in Europe who have experience in, in biotech, in, in biofuels, in real estate. So we've got a good a broad net that we've cast out and all those people can be helpful to our merger candidates in some ways. You know, it's not just about myself and Nick, it's about everybody on our team adding value and, 
you know, pitching in when they can to help the, the merger be a successful outcome for, for our investors and for the company. And, you know, hopefully it gets stood up and one day it's a, you know, a really fantastic public market success story. I'm not coming in, Nick. I uh, want to give uh, some time for any Q&A that's there. I, I was waiting for you. So uh, and I'll, <laughs> I'll defer to uh, the, the Sum Zero team for the mechanisms as to how we, we, uh, we run this here, but it will open up, uh, open up for Q&A. Uh, I know we've had a few things in the chat here. I'm not sure the, the, the mechanisms of how we want to do this, but um, we can start addressing um, what is in the, the chat here um, as, a, as a start. Um, and I think that you know, the first is around um, public and private firms that are leaders in the sector. So you know, maybe Nick or Aaron, if you want to jump in and discuss um, you know, what leadership qualities of public and private firms um, are out there from your vantage point currently, that'd be a good place to start. Yeah, there's a lot of ways you can go with that. I think if, if we're talking about the, the sort of energy transition space, that's one answer. If we're talking about SPACs, that's another. Um, let me just talk, talk about the latter for a second. You know, we think that um, that the SPAC vehicle will continue to be an efficacious way for good companies to raise capital over time. And we intend to be, you know, one of the teams that proves it can be done when everybody cares about their reputation and the outcome of the combined entity. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're looking forward to some of the regulation that's coming in uh, into play that will obviously create some friction, but it will also dissuade a lot of people who were one-off opportunists trying to make a lot of money off of the retail market from, uh, you know, muddying the water here. Um, on, the, on the climate side, you know, we talk a lot about team and that, that, that's no different for the companies that we're discussing merging with. Uh, you got to have a great team to get through the ups and downs. And while these are trillion dollar, multi-decade, very shiny object sectors that are really exciting, whether it's carbon, hydrogen, nuclear, biofuels, sustainable aviation fuel, I mean, really wonderful, profitable industries and companies and outcomes for our environment, there's going to be a lot of ups and downs. It's not a linear trajectory. And those ups and downs, just like every other industry, are best survived by really great teams who, among other things, have a mission that resonates with the people involved. And so when we are talking to, uh, when we're talking to companies about potentially merging with us, the, the very first screen is, do you care? Not can you necessarily do it and make money for your equity investors and the market investors, but do you really care about what's going on? Because without that, when the market does turn like it is right now, a lot of businesses and teams just fold. I think that, you know, one thing to add to, you know, what, what leaders look like right now and how this space uh, is going to evolve is, you know, the first, right now, there's a lot of ESG generalists and that word is changing quite, quite a lot as to how it, how it really defines what a mandate is for an investment manager for a company. And I think if you look at just from a bare bones business perspective, what makes sense today and in the future, take electric cars, for example, you, know, you look at um, versus a traditional internal combustion engine vehicle and electric cars using uh, drastically more, more minerals, right? So just take the lithium graphite complex and then also the semiconductor content in some of these models is roughly 20% in excess of that of a traditional ICE vehicle. So take, for example, you know, look at the pixel shovels of climate change. You know, what you're really looking for is margin protection along the supply chain that is sustainable. So for example, you have an electric car, you know, most people in their vehicle, they care about two things, the experience inside the cabin um, and the fuel economy. You know, those two things are catalyzed by microcontrollers fundamentally, where there's a, a fair degree of margin protection. So if you think about, you know, a trend like electric vehicles, you have Exxon saying every car is going to be electric by 2040. That is the new car that is sold. You know, how does that microcontroller universe, assuming that we're also, you know, in one of the early days of digitization, catch up, right? So there are a lot of these plays that uh, really lend themselves to some of these large growth markets that are really in the supply chain that have long-term sustainable margins and growth. Um, I think it's important to note that. You know, I, there, there were some questions after the fact here around, uh, it's no secret that there's been scrutiny around SPACs. Um, the level of disclosure has gone up. There have been bad actors. Um, you know, and that has created a, a differentiated risk premium, but maybe Nick or Aaron, um, 
I know we touched on this a bit in the discussion, but we want to reiterate um, th that environment and how you guys are doing this. Well, I'll just jump. Yeah, I'll just jump in there and, you know, um, in, in some ways we welcome this scrutiny, you know, we, we want to see good SPACs go to market, rising tide lifts all boats, uh, and, um, you know, we've been disconcerted by some of the, the lower quality stuff that's been brought out, we, we think there's every reason, there's lots of public money looking for ESG investments, so deliver it, deliver a great company, um, that's got good, long, predictable uh, future and uh, show that you've got the right team around it. And uh, we think we'll be rewarded by that. Uh, yes, there's going to be redemptions and there's going to be some of the challenges in the market, but we're managing for that and we're anticipating that and we're you know, lining up the necessary capital um, to make sure that you know, whoever we bring public will have uh, the cash they need to grow when they need it. And, you know, uh, being sort of the second, third wave of SPACs, it kind of suits us because we can learn from the mistakes of the past, anticipate investor concerns, um, and can eliminate risk. And there's no guarantees here, but uh, that's part of the reason why we're feeling confident. Uh, in addition to the, the team that we have and the, and the quality of the targets that we've been able to surface given our vast networks. I, I think you know, we missed uh, one one segment of one of those questions. There is you know what what is needed for the industry to mature to the next level. What does that look like? You know, just from our vantage point, one of the things that that we see that is extraordinary opportunity is just the material substitution and material science alterations in some of these spaces on a go forward basis. You know, if you take um, any basic commodity we use on a day-to-day -day basis and you strip out the projections of growth that a bank puts out and you index it to something uh, like world population growth and then add in a supplementary variable is how many of those people are consuming like we are in the West, are driving cars, eating meat, you run out of on a 40 to 50 year time horizon. There's scarcity in almost all materials. So the material science evolution and innovation that has to come up for us to one transition and to sustain life uh, is, is quite extraordinary. It's not spoke of um, to the degree it should be. And you know, one of the things we focus on, and I think Clean Earth has done a good job of this as well, is you know, really looking at focus areas in the climate economy that are technically prohibited from a human capital perspective, where it's very hard for a journalist to complete, compete holistically. So, you know, I think that what historically has catalyzed the space and we think will on a go forward basis is looking at, you know, take solar, for example, mass manufacturing allowed uh, material science alterations and some of these physical pieces of hardware that allow us to have cost parity power provided by renewable sources. Uh, we're in the first iteration of this with fuel cells um, and this will come, but you know, the, the interesting thing that the Chinese did well that now the Western world is having to, to cope with is, figuring out what the either the, the support mechanism for private capital or the public subsidy regime is to garner mass manufacturing within a jurisdiction focused on these pieces of hardware because the innovation will come as that grows and maybe Nick um, you know looking at historically what has grown the climate economy and then what the next iteration of that is I know that you had a front row seat to the early early days of some of this occurring um, you know, maybe you have some insight into what the next level of this industry looks like based on past innovations and processes. Yeah, as, well, I, I know Aaron's going to have things to say on this, and I know we only got a couple of minutes, so I'll try and keep myself short. But I think we've been defying gravity for a couple of hundred years, and the, the Industrial Revolution has reaped all kinds of benefits in so many ways. But we're now, you know, using uh, three to five times, you know, we're using one and a half times the, world, the, the Earth's regenerative capacity every year. So we're basically liquidating the asset, we're calling it income. Since I was born, uh, resource consumption has gone up 16 fold, population times wealth, uh, middle class, another 2 billion people coming online and in the emerging economies as middle class consumers. Clearly, we just cannot continue the way we are. Um, you know, we're still in some degree of denial, but uh, we're all rapidly waking up to the realities of shortages and volatility and so on. Uh, so I think that um, the good news here now is that this has increasingly got the attention of the best and the brightest people in the world. Uh, and you're seeing a huge amount of talent and 
capital and uh, being put into this. Uh, so I think we're playing catch up, but it's going to be a huge shift. And just the last thing I'd say, you know, change happens very slowly and then happens very suddenly. And I think we've seen this in things like plant based um, uh, consumption and uh, the switch to electric vehicles. So I think we're going to see some areas flip very, very quickly now that we've got the technology and the talent focused on it and the awareness uh, that this is critical. Aaron. That's great. We're, uh, we're running out of time. I think that's a great response. I, I think to, to close this, and there's two questions here we haven't, we haven't, we haven't gotten to, but you know, just at, at, a, at a base level, you know, looking old tech versus what you're doing something that nobody else is doing. Um, you know, a, a lot of these businesses that are set up to be impactful in this transition are not necessarily using new technology. They're changing the way we do things. Um, so take, for example, this big push in hydrogen. You know, utilization of natural gas to make hydrogen and then use it in things like industrial heating, transportation. You know, that steam methane refueling process has been done for 100 years. Um, on the other side of this, you know, my personal belief is in the age of the internet, no one is doing something that no one else is doing. Um, so, you know, there are breakthrough innovations. And a lot of, a lot of this, though, is, is around legacy infrastructure and ecosystems that have to be disrupted or changed or, you know, for example, the product miniaturized on board a vehicle. So, you know, there are certain things that no one else is doing that we're focused on, but really a, a lot of this is taking technologies off the bench that are just at that commercialization scale with institutionalized risk uh, instruments available uh, that can allow them to scale, whether it's capital, whether it's insurance, whether it's a mix of project finance and getting creative about how some of these companies work. The last thing I think it's important, there's a question of where these batteries come from. Um, you know, right now, anything you consume, uh, whether it's your cell phone you're using, your day-to-day -day electronics, that supply chain is rooted in Southeast Asia. Um, you know, it's easy to throw sand on something like electric vehicles or solar panels from coming uh, from that part of the world. But everything we use in modern life, our, uh, our sustenance is provided by cheap goods, which comes from that part of the world. Um, across all facets of our life, not just vehicles, not just cell phones. And you know, some of the extraordinary opportunity comes from building domestic supply chains to process, transport, and refine some of these critical materials that go into batteries. Um, you know, from a resource endowment perspective, the West is never going to compete with other parts of the world. So we don't have pure resource deposits here, but there are ecosystem opportunities that provide better labor opportunities and really allow uh, your middle-class blue-collar people that will say displaced from traditional manufacturing in the Rust Belt to participate in a new industry. Um, and you know, the last thing to add to that is that mineral security versus oil security are totally different things. Um, once a solar panel is operating, those minerals are in it. it. Disruptions come from software issues and balance of plant issues on a go-forward basis, not disruption of continuous combustion and shortages like you see in the oil space. Um, so there are there are similarities in the verticals from a resource security perspective, but they're fundamentally different applications and on a go forward basis have fundamentally different geopolitical implications as to how they're treated from a critical resource perspective. And I think we just hit 1 p.m. Eastern here um, and that uh, that closed this out. So I thank you everyone for being here. Thank you to the Sum Zero team. Um, we've really enjoyed this discussion and I believe this is going to be posted after the fact for uh, secondary viewing as well. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Nick. Thank you, Nick. Thanks, everybody.